Welcome to Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition. Today we're going to talk about the Battle of Cedar Mountain, located in Culpeper County, Virginia, on August 9th, 1862. Confederate Major General Thomas Stonewall Jackson was a household name for both the Confederacy and the Union. His experience and war record were a threat to the Union command, and they knew it. On the Union side was Union Major General John Pope, who was famous with his troops for issuing outlandish orders they would not follow, but whose friends in high political places meant he couldn't be removed from command. In addition, Pope had achieved some success in his campaigning earlier in the year. Pope was now in charge of the newly minted Union Army Virginia, and Stonewall recognized that it would become a very large force. Instead of waiting for Pope to be ready, Jackson decided to attack it while he could. Jackson's movement against Pope, however, had a bad start. There was a heat wave in Virginia during this August, and that combined with Jackson's well-known use of secrecy for his movements meant his commanders were unsure of what routes they would take and couldn't plan appropriately. This resulted in Jackson's famous fast and hardy foot infantry not moving for hours at a time, other units only traveling eight miles in a day. As a result, slowing the movement down incredibly for Jackson's forces overall. On August 8th, Jackson's men crossed the Rapidan River, but did not attack. This was observed by Union Recon, who reported back to General Pope the arrival of Jackson and his army. The heat wave was having an effect on both armies, though. Both commanders saw their troops suffer from fatal heat stroke and exhaustion. Confederate Brigadier General Jubal A. Early was commanding the 1st Brigade on the field and found the Union cavalry spread across the farmland above Cedar Run. Early watched as Union artillery positioned behind the infantry and dug in. In reply, the Confederate artillery was moved up as well clustering some of the artillery in what would become known as Cedar's Knoll. Finally, more Confederate artillery was moved up the mountain and elevated far above the infantry. It would solidly anchor the Confederate right flank. Both sides engaged in what would be an inconclusive artillery duel for most of the day, along with constant pressure by Union troops advancing on the Confederate lines. The one major consequence of the artillery barrage was the death of Confederate Brigadier General Charles S. Winder, who was mortally wounded. He had been ill that day and was taken onto an ambulance wagon. While directing troops from that wagon, he was hit by shrapnel from an artillery shell shredding his left arm inside. He died a few hours later. The command of Confederate Division fell to William Taliaferro, who was not informed on Jackson's battle plan. Once again, a failing of the secrecy habit that Jackson kept. It was around this time that the Union began to move forward. The Union advanced so quickly that they immediately threatened to break the Confederate line. The Union advance had, however, exposed its flank dangerously to the woods. Because of the lack of Confederate leadership, though, with the death of Winder, Jackson's personal Stonewall Brigade did not come up to support the Confederates as they were supposed to. Instead, they stayed back behind artillery. This lack of movement by the Stonewall Brigade prompted Jubal Early to gallop to the front of the line and take initiative to stabilize the area with the Confederate artillery halting the Union advance on that side. Union troops attacked the flank of the 1st Virginia Infantry who broke under their onslaught. They continued forward, flanking the 42nd Virginia, who also buckled and ran. The Union troops ended up in Taliaferro's rear area, behind the artillery, and the Stonewall Brigade were also swept aside by the Union attack. It was at this time that General Jackson rode into the field himself and came upon the Stonewall Brigade. He inspired his troops and attempted to pull a saber out. He had used his saber so little during the war that he found it was rusted inside the sheath and he could not remove it. So he waved the saber and sheath together to push his men forward. He then grabbed the battle flag from a retreating standard bearer and rallied his men. The Stonewall Brigade and supporting units were able to push the Union troops back. In addition, Union troops were running low on ammunition, having been attacking all day away from their supply lines. This resulted in Union soldiers being pushed back and the Confederate line reforming. The Confederates then pushed forward, breaking the Union right flank, pushing the entire Union line into retreat. After pursuing the Union forces for more than a mile and a half, Jackson had his troops pull up. Darkness was approaching and the men were suffering more heat stroke and exhaustion. The battle had been looking bad for Stonewall Jackson and his men, but in the end they had pulled off a victory and the Union forces had retreated. Losses were high in the battle. Union casualties were 2,353. Of that, 314 were killed, 1,445 wounded, 594 were missing. The Confederates, in turn, suffered only 1,338 casualties. Of that were 231 killed and 1,107 wounded. Well, that's it, folks. Please join us again next time on Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition.